Good day and welcome to this week's episode of Trains Travel. We are bringing you this exciting episode from the beautiful mountains of the Free State. We have so much more for you up next. Coming up next on Trains Travel this week, we go on a beautiful South African safari. We look at things to do in the mother city. We look at the much-awaited snowfall in India. And finally, African celebrations. All this and more coming up. Named after Tswana Chief Pilani, the Pilanisburg National Game Reserve is located in the Bujanala region of the Northwest Province in South Africa. The park borders with the entertainment complex Sun City. We're going into Pilansburg National Park, which is where we're going to be doing our game drive or safari, if you prefer to call it that. Um, we say don't expect anything, and then you won't be disappointed. Only things we can ever guarantee are Impala, Zebra, Wildebeest, and the general planes game that we always see. Um, hopefully we'll find some of the big five, which will be your elephant, rhino, buffalo, lion and leopard. So we find one of those that will also be great, but we don't guarantee anything. Well, they're wild and free. They've got minds of their own. They can go wherever they feel. So the idea is to go in there and see what we can find. Right place, right time, and a little bit of luck. We went on a game drive for some wildlife experience. The creation of the reserve is considered one of the most ambitious programs of its kind to be undertaken anywhere in the world. Thanks to Operation Genesis in 1979, which involved the game fencing of the reserve and the reintroduction of many long vanished species. The park has now in excess of 7,000 animals, including 24 of the larger species. An abundance of wildlife proliferate in 580 kilometers of diverse and arresting bushveld terrain. The park is home to healthy populations of Africa's Big Five. The crater of a long extinct volcano is the setting of Pilanisburg National Park, a fascinating alkaline complex produced by volcanic eruptions some 1,300 million years ago. Pilanisburg is one of the largest volcanic complexes of its kind in the world. Off the center of the park is Tabayadiot, the proud mountain. The park ranks among the largest of the national parks in South Africa. It is in fact the fourth largest park and covers an area of 55,000 hectares. The beauty of Pilanisburg is reflected in a large central lake, the Mangwe Dam. South Africa is home to over 10% of the bird species in the world. Bird watching in Pilanisburg is excellent with over 300 species recorded. Some are migrants, others permanent inhabitants. After all the fun and games, what better way to relax than with a luxurious spa treatment? The award-winning Health Spa offers a wealth of beauty and health treatments, from treating sports injuries to having the latest trendy haircut. With its breathtaking views facing the golf course and immaculate design, you are offered a workout and pampering in African paradise. With over two decades of experience, the Gatsby Spa deserves its accolades as one of the best in the world. Before the treatments, you are required to fill in forms that evaluate your stress levels, which for me were extremely high. The evaluation gives the therapist direction as to which treatment to provide. We were welcomed by one of the friendly and efficient therapists, Lebu. Okay, so for 25 minutes. Are you ready? I'm so excited, I cannot wait. You can follow me this way. Okay, 
After a long drive in the scorching heat, trying to spot the big five, this was the perfect treat for me. The spa prides itself in using natural African products and oils developed in the vineyards of Stellenbosch in South Africa. The back and neck massage is a great way to ease the tension that is brought on by the day-to-day -day hassles of modern day life. Lebu's magical hands and expertise ease the tension and worries away, even if it was just for a few minutes. As much as I would have loved to stay there the rest of the day, I had to get back to work. Like the saying goes, all good things come to an end. How is your treatment? Oh, you know, the treatment was amazing. So did you enjoy it? Yes, I did. Yes, okay. I did. It was great. Okay. So how many times do you have your massage like normally? Once every six months, if I'm lucky. <laughs> uh, uh, no, you must find time at least once a month. Uh, but if you don't have find time, you must like have a home care product that you use at home. Mm -hmm. Like now, I use the muscular bank oil in a jar. So we, yeah, we've got a retail in there, then you can just buy it for yourself and then use them at home. But you don't use them during the day, like at night. Because when you do a lot of movement, you set your product away. So it's nice to use your product after taking a shower at night and then you go straight to the bed. Okay. But how often do I use the product then? Like it depends how you feel when you have aching and spasms. Okay. Yes, that's where you can use them and then if you feel you just be fine, you can just stop. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Alright, right. okay. the time. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed all the animals and fun stuff in Sun City. We have so much more for you just after the break. Stay with us. One of South Africa's most beautiful destinations, a coastal city most well known for its spectacular views. It's home to our national parliament and many other historical monuments that are part of this country. This is Cape Town. Um, our mission is the same, our quest continues, and we're out here to find out from the movers and shakers that are part of shaping this city. The shape was a really important for our campaign and it was really key for us to get the right people by city. So we spoke to some of uh, the influential shapers and creatives from Durban, Joburg and Cape Town. They told us which guys we should go for, um, guys who are really creative, really exciting. And then from there we basically did our own research, came down to a, to a few guys that we've worked with and um, they're really, really doing a great job at the moment. And, um, very excited to be part of the campaign. The concept of shaping your city is a global concept for Heineken, and the belief is that your city is your canvas. You know, if you add to your city, you not only do it for yourself, but you do it for those around you. And I think the idea here is to make sure that we go to a forgotten um, part of town or forgotten area in the city and really, really revamp it, turn a sleepy neighborhood into a, um, an exciting one, and that's what we're trying to do. And I think at the moment it's really, really working out um, very well. And not only is Heineken enjoying this campaign, but also the people from those communities in those cities also get a benefit from it. 
We started off at the beautiful Charlie's Bakery in Zonnebloom to find out about Mac One's graffiti and how he uses the art to regenerate and revitalize urban spaces. We started about 16 years ago, but the Charlie's concept we started 26 years ago, and it's a family-run business which Charlie and I started together. Um, Charlie passed in 2012 and we now have our two daughters running the business with me. Um, it's a family business, we put love into everything we do, we make what we want, we don't, we, we play, we have fun and everything here is made with love. You can definitely see the love, I mean just look at this building, the way, what, what brings behind the creative process of wanting to have a building that looks so beautiful, it's like okay, you could literally eat the building. When we found this building, we wanted this building with everything in us. And it was this beautiful old building built in 1898, and it had just been neglected. And we wanted to keep it beautiful, and we wanted people to see exactly what it's about. So we kept all the original fittings inside, and we were really dedicated to the history of the building. But then we decided we want to call in Mac One and get him to make this building look like a giant cake. And we've always loved graffiti, we've always loved um, art on buildings, and we wanted to show people that it didn't have to be something which was not allowed. We wanted to actually bring it into the mainstream. Mm. And people were really shocked when Max started on the building. It took him seven solid weeks with two guys to help him to paint this whole building. And he, he's phenomenal. And it's now become one of the most photographed buildings in our country. What graffiti does, the graffiti art does, it reinvents everything it touches or engages with. So me partnering with Heineken and with two other sh um, city shapers on this, on this project is to show the amazing, the amazing uh, possibilities of this art form if, you, if it's approached properly and it's done in a way that it will affect everyone that sees it no matter where you come from, no matter your background. Mac One and Think King have a lot in common. The inventive and wacky designs that formulate a practical and attractive activation from Lyle Sprung and Mark Nicholson make this shaper's team a perfect match for this installation project. I think we were approached by MC Sachi Abel and indirectly through uh, Sonic State. Um, they kind of told us about this competition to develop a uh, kind of party idea that uh, was based on insights of one of the cities, our, our city being Cape Town. Um, and we were kind of excited by the possibility of creating like the most exciting event that we could possibly think of. You have to find the beauty in it and then bring it across where it's not just you, the, the artist painting, but the collaboration between you and people outside of you who's not just in the same circle of art form or business or likes, and then find a way to collaborate and make something that everyone loves to see and want to be part of all the time and aspire to go into or do their own thing. But similar to what our country has done and Mandela, Nelson Mandela and did, you know, to everyone and it brought them together and shaped the whole country in a different direction. That is one of my inspiration. There are a lot of different concepts that hasn't been like resolved into one core idea, but the, um, he's constantly like feeding back to us about ideas about graffiti or what graffiti means to him, what possibilities of graffiti within like the context of the city. So that sort of helps to steer the ideas. Yeah, normally it's us working with clients um, and it's been really exciting to collaborate with someone as a kind of creative rather than trying to kind of fulfill the needs um, of other people's ideas. So we've been able to have someone with a different skill set all together and I think um, the way in which we engage and think about things has also really encouraged him to kind of think about things on different levels, you know, like, like um, he's very um, interested in, in, in kind of graffiti and, and, and what being a graffiti artist is um, and we interested in, in our own field um, as, uh, as um, kind of deeply as he is so, so I think it's been really interesting to kind of just bounce ideas with each other and see where that kind of takes us.
it's a pretty rad old space in one of the quieter parts of the city, um, kind of just off of Harrington Street. And it's the installation is going to have to do with something with the facade and then what happens once you kind of get past the facades into the building. That's really centered on, on the building itself. Yeah, I think the exciting thing for us is that it's not a kind of uh, purely public space um, and therefore it feels like there's a little bit more freedom and, and we can really just do whatever we want because it's kind of like inner city and it doesn't feel like we're putting um, something up there that's, that's, that people would, would take offense to in any way. So it's just, it's just got like, the, the possibilities are really exciting. Why do I love my city? Um, besides the fact that I'm born and bred here, I think it's um, a great global city. Um, we can really put Cape Town on the world stage. Um, it's got a mix of cultures, beautiful people, beautiful music, exciting views. Um, and I think that's what I love most about it. I'm not going to go into the mountain and beach and all those sort of things, but it's really home. And you know what they say, home is where the heart is. And um, that's why I love my city. I think for us, it's definitely like from our, our personal experience is the, like engaging with nature on a daily basis. Um, so like we're either in the water or up the mountain, either in the early morning or in the evening. Um, and then just like living, it's incredibly beautiful. So the, the, and living with beauty around you all the time that's relatively intact if you, if you take a couple of steps out of the city is very cool. Every phase of my life, um, Cape Town's been able to um, not only kind of fulfill my needs, but, but um, be more than I've kind of ever could have asked for. So whether it's finding the right community to raise kids in or um, a place in which um, there are great parties happening every night uh, and going out and meeting people, a place where you can study and at, at ev every stage there's the mountain and the sea in which you can kind of explore and they are unlimited places to explore 20 minutes from wherever you live in Cape Town, which feels like radical. I have a lifelong affinity for this town and it's truly just getting better on a year-on-year -year basis. It's truly, it's a resort city. It's somewhere we can work and holiday. December 2016 will never be the same again. Shimmy Beach had Black Coffee as the resident DJ every Friday through the Lifestyle Month. Well, Shimmy Beach Club uh, has been voted and is the number one beach club in Africa. Geographically speaking, it can never be replicated. We're the only venue of the size, we're the only place that can have venue uh, functions like this, outdoor music events, and that's why we attract the best uh, artists and we can throw the best parties. I mean, the setting is unique, it's a one of a kind. A lot of care and thought goes into it. I mean, show me, uh, it's a big venue. Uh, the market, only said big, and we want to appeal to many different markets. Uh, when we were looking at uh, we were going to be our summer residence. Obviously, the success of Shemi has also been partly due to our submerged Sundays, which is tonight, uh, with Goldfish. And when we were looking at who else can fill a venue to the capacity and run queues, it was logical. I mean, Black Coffee is the best. He's the best DJ in Africa and in, in one of the best in the world. So, I mean, we're the best venue. So, the fit and the residency just makes so much sense. <laughs> If you're still watching Trends Travel, we have so much more for you just after the break, so don't go anywhere. Tourists in Indian Kashmir, popular in winters for its snow-laden mountains, were thrilled to experience snowfall on Wednesday after a prolonged dry spell. Snowfall in the upper reaches of resort town Gulmarj ended the northernmost state's longest reported dry spell in 40 years. Gulmarj is a popular destination for winter sports such as snowboarding, skating, sledge rides, gondola joints, cable car rides and skiing. The snow is expected to draw more tourists. Babe, 
पहली बार और लकी है कि आज हुई बर्फबारी वरना हम आज मिस कर जाते हैं अगर आज भी नहीं होती बहुत अच्छा लगा बहुत सबको सजेस्ट करने वाले हैं जाके कि यहाँ जरूर आए Tourism is the backbone of the province with majority of locals dependent on it directly and indirectly. The long post-monsoon dry spell had set off alarm bells in Kashmir and worries about a possible water shortage. Meanwhile, snowfall in Rajuri district blocked the Mughal road which connects it with the province's Punch district. Authorities have requested for temporary closure of the road for the safety of commuters. हम यही रिकमेंड कर रहे हैं अपने चीफ साहब को कि अब आज से गाड़ियां बंद की जाएं क्योंकि विंटर जोन के लिए हर साल बंद करते हैं इस साल भी बंद करेंगे ताकि लोगों की सेफ्टी मलूज नजर रखते हुए कोई एक्सीडेंट ना हो इसलिए जरूरी है ना Temperatures usually dip to sub-zero levels during this time of the year and a thick blanket of snow engulfs the region. Bird watchers and tourists flock to India's northern Varanasi city to observe migratory birds that have arrived to escape the extreme cold on their arctic home grounds. With the onset of winter, the Siberian birds spread their wings to begin a journey spanning thousands of kilometers. People thronged the banks of the river Ganges and took boat rides to be able to see migratory birds like large cormorant, bar-headed geese, northern pintail, reddish shelduck, and golden pheasant among others up close. Tourists captured the birds on their cameras as they glided over the river Ganges. I can see everything, including the bird, and the river, the body, the people, the dance, and they watch the body and the the bird fly in the sky. Well, everything is incredible, and I feel very comfortable. The arrival of migratory birds also brings cheer to the boatmen who earn handsome amounts as they ferry batches of tourists close to the birds multiple times in a day. ये वजह से घाट किनारे रहने वाले काफी टूरिस्ट आते हैं और जो कि एंजॉय करते हैं और इनको जो है कि हम लोग जैसे घाट किनारे पर लोग आते हैं रहने वाले घाट किनारे पर रोजगार मिल जाती है धंधा इनसे हो जाती है These birds from Siberia and Central Asia use wetlands as their transitory camps which play a vital role in sustaining a large population of breeding birds. These birds start arriving from early November onwards and continue until December. They return during the spring season. Crossing with Omari Isamali is one of the coolest things you can do off of Lamu Island. This drama wants to make it big in music. But in the meantime, he has to pay his bills. So, he is thumping the tabs for customers on his traditional dow boat and making some extra cash. He charges between 5 and 15 US dollars for a ride. Omari prefers to ply the waters in the evening when the wind is calm, making for a relaxing trip across the bay. Performing most of the time at Manda Beach, Manda Beach floating bar. We're performing in the Dows also, you know, for visitors. The 39-year-old spent his adult life in Colorado, America, as a professional drummer. He moved abroad in 1995 with the help of a tourist friend. The two lived together as partners for about 10 years. In 2005, they separated and Omar relocated to California. But according to him, life in the States is not easy. So he moved back home to try out composing and singing songs while sailing. Omari's music can be described as a fusion of western and contemporary songs but reggae is in his blood
Lagos. He began dipping his toe in reggae music in 2008 with songs like Kwanini, Swahili for Why. Zile zito mbozo na inspire minu kuandika isi nyumbo ni kusu love, you know, unity, yeah, ama hishma, you know, and uh, universal kusema kwa kweli, you know, what is going on today is what I sing today. His five foot long dreadlocks of over 20 years are his inspiration. Rasta strength is what keeps me alive, you know, it's what uh, makes me do what I do now as a musician, you know, and I respect Rasta because it's guidance of us as Africans, you know, before the razors, before all other people come around here, we were just like this, you know, and it's also represent the revolutionary that has been happening in Kenya and around the world, you know, so I carry that. Most of his lyrics are written in Swahili language. His demeanor often charms even those who don't understand the lines. And his music is like magnetic, full of energy, and can involve everyone who is playing with, with him. It's something special he has. I really like how he treats and how he plays with kids as well, because it's like he enjoy and all the people in enjoy. For me, it's a really special, even I don't understand Swahili and I'm not from this culture. It's like you don't need to understand the lyrics. It's only how the music involves you and it's like, wow. Omari is also the founder of Lamu's popular group dubbed Twashukuru Band. The team of four not only sings while sailing in the ocean, but also entertains fans in bars and restaurants. Despite having a faithful fan base among the locals, the crew is struggling to make ends meet. Most of their songs are sitting around collecting dust. They lack money to fund their music career. At the moment we are famous, we'll be very happy if we can get any willing sponsor who can help us get musical equipment. This is due to the fact that we use these small drums and we need a drum set. We have a big team but few drums. We have very small drum and we want like our drum to go more high. Meanwhile, Omari's band is working to produce their first ever album since they came together. The album will carry 10 songs. We play the music for the poor. We play the music for the Even though Omari is a veteran, it's been said 40 is the new 20. So for him and his bandmates, their whole lives and careers stretches out before them full of promise. Welcome back. The reason we are in the Free State today is to experience the beautiful cultures of South Africa coming together in music and dance. We have this whole experience for you coming up next. The mountainous Eastern Free State played host to a cultural extravaganza which originated in Guazulu Natal. Thousands from all nine provinces descended on Guagua to celebrate in cultural song and dance and to soak up and learn from the diverse and colorful tribes of South Africa. Oh, 
The festival is the brainchild of Prince Africa Zulu of the Onkweni Royal House, whose mission on inception was to shed light on dying cultures so as the important knowledge is never lost. Social cohesion is also the main focus, as tribalism is an ever-present threat in a country with more than 12 differing tribes, not to mention subcultures. For many, it has become the highlight of their December calendar. Uh, it has been six years uh, been performing for this uh, event, and uh, this event it has created many opportunities, especially for the youth and also for the uh, uh, actually South Africans. I think it is a, a platform for South Africans to remember where we come from. So it comes uh, there actually a good time in December, whereby it's a celebration. So it's a good time that we are here today and we celebrate. <laughs> The festival also hopes to preserve and transfer knowledge of our indigenous African cultures to the young. Africa, <laughs> I enjoy to be here. This is very nice. I like it. I wish the other people, uh, they must make the, the team uh, so that they can teach this young one the tradition of their cultures. It's very important to us here. Yeah, that's how we experience more about cultures different cultures yeah and how to communicate with them lana sitekto zala babemtwana usendele ukuthi ngulona loyo ativete buve bakhe la achamuka khona njengoba nisibona thi nesilana sibantwana bemaswati ende siyatichenya ngebiswati bethu siyachenya ngembele we are looking forward to experiencing a brighter and bigger celebration in December 2017. They came out in their numbers to usher in the Dogon Festival happening for the first time in years. The carnival celebrates the culture and heritage of Mali's Dogon people. This is uh, an opportunity to show the Dogon culture to the Dogons that are no longer living in the Dogon country. And many of us are, for work reasons and for other reasons, living uh, in Bamako or around Bamako. And our children uh, often don't have the opportunity to see our culture. Even though uh, sometimes they go visit family, they don't get an uh, opportunity to get, be exposed to the music, to the art, and to the other cultural aspects of the Dogon culture. The festival was held after every three years, but was put on hold due to political turmoil and insecurity in northern Mali. Its revival is one of Mali's efforts to boost the country's tourism industry and in return improve the economy. 
Taking into account the current security crisis, we are currently developing a campaign to promote local tourism. We want to encourage Malians living in the country and those who live abroad to rediscover the country's cultural heritage. The Dogon people are best known for their mythology, masks, dances, wooden sculptures and architecture. Their culture is one of Mali's major tourist attractions. Members of this ethnic group live in the central plateau region of Mali in Western Africa. The ancient tribe is however on the verge of extinction. The numbers have gradually dwindled over the years due to wars. Today, their population stands at about 800,000 people. The precise origin of the Dogon people, like those of many other ancient cultures, is still unknown. But their art and culture has remained one of the authentic on the African continent. The festival is also seen as a show of resilience for a country considered by many as a peaceful cultural getaway in West Africa. No, people are not afraid of attacks. They just think they are petty thieves. But this will not stop us from leaving, to go out or go to work for fear of an attack. No, we will continue to work. And we will not allow those who want to spread terror and stop us from working. In Mali, festival events are frequently held according to the seasons, ethnic customs and myths specific to the different regions. While many are not open to the public, there also exist numerous occasions that people from outside can experience. Such well-known festivals are Timbuktu Desert Festival, Segu Festival on the Niger and Great Mosque Festival. Each year, an imam announces the date when the entire population of Jene gathers to apply fresh mud on the city's historic Great Mosque. Afterwards, all Jene celebrate with a big feast filled with dancing and drumming. The Timbuktu Desert Festival is one of the most popular events in West Africa. It's an annual musical showcase which evolved from a traditional Tuareg gathering filled with lively discussions and fun to an international event of peace. The Segol Festival, on the other hand, is characterized by music, dance, puppet shows, workshops, craft vendors, and pirogue boat races along the Niger River. Back to the Dogon Festival, the masks worn by the men during the celebrations represent Ama, the Dogon goddess of creation. The goddess is believed to contain the souls of the dead and drive away evil spirits. And at the end of the three-day event, buffalo and hyena masks are used to predict the tribe's future. Preparing bridal bundles, volunteers from an Algerian charity are organizing a mass wedding for 30 couples. In ornate baskets are traditional wedding shoes, clothes and handbags as well as other items making up the wedding trousseau. The event is organized and funded by Ichen Association, a charitable organization in the North African state. As well as clothes for the bride and groom, a traditional feast is prepared by women in the town of Sala for the wedding banquet. Among those attending the celebration were a number of dignitaries, including Mana Sobeya, the Palestinian ambassador's wife.
A wedding in Algeria is a costly affair, and many of the young couples tying the knot don't have means to wed. For the young grooms, traditions were marked with the application of eyeliner and henna to their hands. 29-year-old Abdelamelik Mohammed is among those marking his big day. And that's all we have for you on this week's segment of Trends Travel. We hope to see you next week, same time, same place. From our channel 404 and SABC3 viewers, see you next time.